our third panel. Each witness has been asked to make an opening statement of five minutes. We shall hear from the witnesses and then turn to questions from the senators. With us in person at the table, I wish to welcome Nicholas Marcus Thompson, who is the executive director of the Black Class Action Secretariat, Hugh Scher, human rights and constitutional lawyer, and Richard Sharp, who is the director of Black Equity Branch within the Center for the People, Culture and Talent, Treasury Board Secretariat of the Ontario Public Service. I now invite Mr. Thompson to make his presentation, to be followed by Mr. Sher and finally Mr. Sharp. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I appear before you uh, today in two capacities. First, as the Executive Director of the Black Class Action Secretariat, which is a nonprofit organization that is representing th tens of thousands of uh, employees of the federal government that identify as black for decades of systemic anti-black discrimination uh, in the federal public service. Second, I appear before you as president of the Union of Taxation Employees, Toronto North, representing approximately 1,400 employees at the Canada Revenue Agency. In this capacity, I have supported many employees with their complaints to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I've also experienced firsthand the various barriers and obstacles to process and adjudicate complaints of all kinds before the Canadian Human Rights Commission, particularly race-based complaints. I would like to begin by acknowledging that anti-black racism is deeply entrenched in all of our public institutions, including the Canadian Human Rights Commission. This has also been acknowledged on many occasions by the different leaders of our public service, from the RCMP to the Treasury Board and throughout the public service. As a matter of fact, the Prime Minister of Canada has repeatedly highlighted the concerns about anti-black racism and systemic discrimination throughout our public services. As an elected union representative, I have observed rampant anti-black racism at the Canada Revenue Agency. This systemic and institutional nature of such complaints make them difficult or impossible to address institutionally or as part of the grievance process oriented towards individual grievances. The same is true regarding individual complaints before the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Over the past 50 years, the Commission has done nothing to effectively address the widespread practice of black employee exclusion in hiring and promotion throughout the entire federal public service. Such failures call into question the mandate and the capacity of the Commission to address such systemic complaints. The fact is, internal race-based uh, discrimination at the Commission itself represents a major obstacle and has resulted in a loss of confidence of the Commission to meet its mandate. Following the grievance process, I often advise employees to submit a complaint to the Commission. Therefore, this submission is based on those experiences. Employees often experience long de delays in receiving an initial response from the Commission. Race-based complaints are almost always denied, leaving these employees broken and without justice. These complaints are frequently struck at early stages of the process before full information or evidence is learned by the Commission. Often, when advised by the Union to submit a complaint to the Commission, employees are afraid of not to, citing lack of trust in the Commission. To put this into simple perspective, employees are fearful of utilizing the complaint process at the Canadian Human Rights Commission because it triggers more trauma. You have to retell your story over and over. and employees rather salvage the little hope uh, that they have and the little strength that they have left to cope with the trauma that they experience in federal workplaces. In 2020, after going through all of understanding the commission and, and the lack of process uh, in terms of justice at the commission, I mobilized workers uh, starting at the CRA, 
to understand their experiences as it pertains to anti-black racism. And as I spoke to workers across the federal government, the common theme existed, that black employees were left in entry-level positions uh, while being exceptionally qualified, some with multiple degrees, they're retiring broke and broken in the same position after decades of loyally serving the government and people of Canada. And when I went to the commission, I thought I would find something different at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, created under legislation to protect human rights. And I was deeply wrong. Employees at the commission told me that they experienced the discrimination at the commission was so strong. Some had to take sick leave for a lengthened period of times. Some resigned from the commission due to the rampant nature of anti-black racism. And they share the similar experience as employees in the rest of the public service. And that is, at the commission, black and racialized employees are in entry-level positions, doing all the screenings, and that White employees held all the management positions all the way up to the top. As a matter of fact, there has never been in the history of the commission a black commissioner, a black chief commissioner. Um, and the commission was established in some, somewhere in 1977. Um, so that in itself is, is, is appalling. But they tell me about this toxic culture at the commission and that those experiences at the commission, what the employees experienced, showed it, it gave me more perspective on the employees on the outside who were filing complaints to the commission. The, because on the outside, here I am experiencing with workers their complaints being dismissed, them being afraid, and we're still encouraging them to try to use the commission, but their lack of trust in the commission. And then on the other side, the employees at the commission facing discrimination and they're saying as well that when they file, when they make a decision on race-based complaints at the commission, and that complaint goes up to their uh, usually white supervisor, how those complaints are disproportionately rejected. So, the, the broad-based experience of anti-black racism throughout the federal public service led us to file a historic class action against the entire federal public service. None of the mechanisms, the grievance process, the federal board, the Human Rights Commission uh, was able to address systemic anti-black racism. As a matter of fact, it perpetuated to a point that it was so hurtful to workers with no redress. Like Caroline, who worked for the RCMP for 37 years and never received a promotion. Or other employees who worked for up to 50 years, still working, unable to retire. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really appalling. And it's in key institutions that workers rely on for justice. Um, workers rely on for leadership, like the Treasury Board of Canada. Working, black workers working on the mental health program there, all of them fired after they raised concerns of anti-black racism. And it's the same Treasury Board that made the ruling that the Canadian Human Rights Commission was discriminatory towards black employees. So we have this vicious cycle within the federal public service where there's no accountability. Wrongdoers are often either transferred when it comes to discrimination or promoted, as we've recently seen in the case where uh, a senior executive at the Canadian Human Rights Commission was promoted less than a month after this finding of discrimination at the commission. Less than a month. And promoted to where? In charge of racism, anti-racism for the entire federal public service. So where do workers turn to if we can't turn to the Canadian Human Rights Commission? So we would like to make some recommendations. And a root part of the problem here is the Employment Equity Act. Because the Employment Equity Act groups all racialized people into one group, federal employers have consistently excluded black employees from promotional opportunities because it's not defined. 
So there is probably one or two racialized group that is the government's preferred employment equity uh, uh, groups that the, that, the, that the government, throughout the government, consistently uses. Um, when we filed this class action in 2020, there were 99 black executives throughout the federal public service, none at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. 99 out of 6,200 executives across the federal government. And federal employers have consistently told me the problem is the Employment Equity Act. We cannot tailor such, uh, uh, staffing and competition for black employees because the act does not allow us to. Uh, when I presented a plan to develop black employees utilizing the staffing mechanism in the public service, they said that it would be discriminatory to white employees if you target employment to black employees. So we are proposing that the government amend the Employment Equity Act to create a designated group for black employees apart from racialized employees. That's the only way we'd be able to address black employee exclusion in the federal public service. This would prevent federal employers from hiding behind the visible minorities category and excluding black employees intentionally. You'll hear from witnesses like Bernadette Betchy, who has multiple degrees and the sister is unable to move ahead at the commission. It is just appalling. It is hurtful. It is not the Canada that, that we're, we're proud of, the multiculturalism and, and diversity. So we're seeking an amendment to the Employment Equity Act to designate the black people as a separate category. And that's when staffing issues at the commission uh, there would be a designated category, so when there is a gap for black employees, the commission would have to hire qualified, competent, merit-based black Canadians just by looking at the black category. Uh, secondly, we would recommend the creation of a direct access model for adjudication so that complaints can go directly to the tribunal. Next, we need to have accountability. We do not trust the commission to be accountable or the rest of the public service to be accountable on these matters of race. So we are calling for a black equity commissioner to be able to investigate systemic anti-black racism at the commission and throughout the federal public service, holding the public service accountable and would have the ability to take uh, the required steps to eliminate and to prevent this type of discrimination. My final recommendation was that um, human lives have been significantly impacted as a result of actions at the commission, as well as throughout the public service. Although the, the grievance finding provides a finding, a declaration. These employees continue to suffer. Um, there must be some type of remedy for these workers who are impacted. Workers who've served decades and still in their, in their retirement, they're coming out and telling us about the trauma, the hurt, uh, and the pain. So there must be compensation and meaningful redress for employees impacted by systemic discrimination and the failure to remove barriers to the full participation of black employees at all levels. You've all mentioned a black equity commissioner. If you could tell us in your ideal world, what, what is that? What would it look like? What are you recommending here? Thank you. There's a significant distrust in the public service, particularly amongst black uh, employees in terms of any type of investigation or systemic barriers that they face. Um, and a big part of the challenge and why we're unable to address anti-black racism is that the same leadership, the same public service that has carried out acts of discrimination that have harmed employees is the same public service leadership that the government 
has called on to address the issue. So that's why we'll see things like the clerk's call to action never being implemented to sponsor, promote, um, and support black employees to leadership position because the Public Service of Canada does not believe that there is a problem of anti-black racism. All of their measures are performative by nature. Therefore, a, a black equity commissioner will do exactly uh, what Mr. Sher has indicated that would, uh, uh, we're seeking a commission structure that is uh, fully funded, that has the power to police the public service because we do not trust the public service to police themselves. Those who have oppressed uh, workers for, for decades now responsible for that change. So we're seeking to have that neutral third party that would have the, the training and expertise uh, in terms of addressing uh, these issues. Question of Mr. Thompson before our very uh, August chair cuts me off. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Thompson, in your opinion, does unconscious bias training work? Thank you for giving me the hardest question, Senator. Um, no. The, the challenge is, the challenge is, is that unconscious bias, the term is now being used, excuse bias and racism and, and discrimination. I did not know that I was discriminating against you. I did not know um, it was my unconscious bias. <laughs> well, that is only further perpetuating the discrimination and the hurt and harm uh, towards uh, black Canadians, and, and in this case, in the, in the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. I listened to the previous witnesses, and then I listened to you, and I get the impression that really... Uh, there's there's no trust. The, the relationship of trust that existed is broken. There are incredible delays processing complaints. The victims often have to wait an insane amount of time to get access to a remedy. So do you still trust the commission at all? And if so, what type of reform do you think needs to be made? And if you want to have an equity commissioner, would you imagine both of these things happening at once? So first of all, reforming the commission, and then secondly, having this uh, commissioner who, who would be in direct contact with the complainants. And how do you see that working? Can we reform the commission? Or should we completely let the commission collapse, just throw it out? To, to put it um, very clear, we do not have any trust in the Canadian Human Rights Commission to deliver justice, to deliver its mandate. It has demonstrated over decades that it has failed. It has failed. Um, particularly black Canadians in terms of executing its mandate under the prescribed legislation. And the only way to move forward is to have this direct access model in addition to other systemic remedies, such as uh, amendments to the Employment Equity Act, uh, such as other accountability measures, um, such as the Black Equity Commissioner, I have to say it again, we have no confidence in the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for raising that point. I want to um, talk about that in October of 2022, the Commission released its anti-racism action plan, the Progress Report, uh, which outlines the actions taken by the Commission under its original plan the outcomes achieved and the future steps that will be pursued. Your assessment of that plan and what impact did that have externally and internally? I'll, I'll begin uh, and just briefly, I had a look at the plan uh, and, and the report and 
the report demonstrate the, the clear flaws in the system. For example, the report states that the commission is meeting all of its targets on employment equity. Nothing further. <laughs> You're a lawyer, a public servant. Uh, now, there are forms for voluntary disclosure that exist in some of these contexts where you can s declare your race, your, your ethnic group, your gender. A lot of people are against that type of declaration. What is your point of view uh, you know, when it comes to recruitment, promotion, that sort of thing. Is this useful or is it discriminatory? It is uh, absolutely necessary, the collection of data. Uh, the challenge is that in the past it has been used in a discriminatory manner. So there is a lack of trust in terms of the collection and how disaggregated data is used but it is absolutely necessary if we are to understand where each group is, which group needs some help, which, need, which group needs more help. Um, it is critical, but there's a serious trust factor in terms of making that declaration. Workers have told me they, they, they do not fill out, fill out those because they do not want to be identified. They do not want to face um, any type of discrimination, and that has been their experience. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your testimony. You've given us a lot to think about, and your testimony will help us when we write the report and we write the recommendations. And we had a very successful spot study last time, and I'm hoping that this spot study will have the same success.